Sometimes a good deal is just not a good deal. When you go to the furniture store that's having their 18th going out of business sale of the year, or when you go to a car dealership who's having their yearly, you know, Christmas sale when they pump down the prices to where they should be normally, or whatever else, you know, or, or the ADP of a guy who finishes the RB12 last year because he fell into the end zone 18 times, now being drafted as the RB14, and, you know, maybe it's still not a good deal even though it kind of seems like one. And that's why I'm here to say what the fuck is up with these deals. My name is Noah Hills. You can find me on Twitter at NoahMoreParties. And my last video talked about some of these underpriced running backs going for less in ADP right now than where they finished last season. But today I'm here to talk about some of those same guys, but who I'm still fading despite the discounted prices. Let's do it. The easiest thing you can do in fantasy football is fade the guy who scored an unsustainable amount of touchdowns last season. And that's why the first guy I want to talk about is James Conner, who last year finishes the RB8 in PPR points per game, and is now being drafted as the RB14 by ADP. We can take a, a little bit further look into this like unsustainable touchdown scoring from James Conner last season. League-wide, in the NFL last year, running backs scored touchdowns on 3.2% of their carries. Throughout his career, prior to last season, James Conner scored a touchdown on 4.1% of his carries. So, Overall, you know, he's he's a Pro Bowl guy, he's an above-average running back, and, you know, accordingly, he's scoring touchdowns at a slightly above-average rate. He's a good player. Last year, in 2021, James Conner scored a touchdown on 7.4% of his carries. That's like if you took his career touchdown rate and the NFL average touchdown rate and added them together, that's how often, you know, James Conner was scoring touchdowns last year. I do think that while his, his touchdown rate was high, that's not really just because... He was, I mean, it really wasn't because he was like scoring from long range. Like he, he wasn't doing that. He wasn't putting together like these Derrick Henry, Jonathan Taylor long runs. And it wasn't just because he was getting a lot of carries near the end zone. Although that's true across the NFL, 8.7% of running back carries came from within the 10 yard line. James Conner had 13.9% of his carries come within the 10 yard line last year. That gives you, you know, a significant increase in opportunities to score touchdowns. However, James Conner was also just good near the goal line. On carries within the 10-yard line, running backs league-wide had a 51.2% success rate. So whether that means getting a first down, getting a touchdown, just getting a requisite amount of yards to, you know, kind of increase your odds of getting a first down next time, NFL running backs were succeeding within the within the 10-yard line at a 51% clip last year. James Conner was succeeding within the 10-yard line at a 64% clip. And his touchdown rate from within the 10-yard line was 43% versus a league-wide touchdown rate within the 10-yard line of 28%. He had a lot of high-volume short yardage and goal line opportunity, and he was ridiculously efficient in those situations. But I think he's a legitimately good touchdown scorer regardless, even going back to early on in his career, where his touchdown rate within the 10-yard line was 57%, so above league average. And his touchdown rate from within the 10-yard line was 39%, so still above league average, slightly less than where he was at last year, but above league average. I think he's a good touchdown scorer. The problem is that James Conner scored 47% of his points, of his total fantasy points, from within the 10-yard line last season. Running backs league-wide scored less than 27% of their total fantasy points from within the 10-yard line. And so Conner was scoring more than 20% more of his fantasy points within the 10-yard line in, in the goal-to-go area than running backs league-wide were. And that, you know, maybe that's not an issue. You know, he's scoring a lot of touchdowns. He's getting a lot of opportunities down there. But that means despite 80% of his carries coming outside of the red zone compared to 84% for running backs league-wide, so he's in the ballpark, 80% of his carries came outside of the red zone last year, but only 38% of his fantasy points were scored outside of the red zone, compared to 66% non-red zone fantasy points for NFL running backs league-wide. So he's scoring an incredibly high outlier amount of his fantasy points within the red zone, and especially within the 10-yard line, compared to running backs league-wide, making him susceptible to touchdown regression, making a big impact on his overall fantasy scoring. Touchdowns accounted for 42% of James Conner's total fantasy points last year, 
The average for RB1 finishers was 26%, and the only other RB3 or better in fantasy last year who had more than 40% of their fantasy points come from touchdowns was Damian Harris. If you remove touchdowns, if nobody gets credit for any touchdowns, James Conner would drop from RB8 to RB20. If nobody got points for touchdowns, James Conner would be scoring the same amount of fantasy points per game as Miles Sanders. Like, other than touchdowns, this guy is a complete jag, barely worth putting in your lineup. Another angle here is that in nine games with Chase Edmonds in the lineup last year, James Conner averaged 11.3 carries per game, 0.78 targets per game, so not even a full target per game, and 11.2 fantasy points per game. That would make him the RB32, and in those nine games, he scored only 40% of his total fantasy points. In six games without Chase Edmonds, he had 16.7 carries, 5.3 targets, and 26.1 fantasy points per game, which would have made him the RB1, and in those six games, he scored 60% of his total fantasy points. And if you look at Chase Edmonds' workload in games with James Conner, he averaged 9 carries and 4.2 targets per game while playing with James Conner. When Edmonds was out of the lineup, Eno Benjamin came in and had 5.4 carries and 1.8 targets per game. So Chase Edmonds was seeing nearly twice the opportunity that Eno Benjamin was while playing with James Conner, and so there was like a huge drop-off when Chase Edmonds was out of the lineup in, you know, opportunity for the second running back in this offense that got put on to James Conner and he, you know, produced much more in fantasy in those games as a result. And I think there are two ways to interpret that information. Number one, Chase Edmonds is now gone. He's playing in Miami, and so Connor is going to be elite. Like, he had an elite workload with Chase Edmonds gone. Chase Edmonds is now permanently gone. Why wouldn't Connor be elite? The second way to interpret that is Eno Benjamin just wasn't ready last year in Chase Edmonds' absence. And so now... They've been talking up Chase Edmonds in the offseason. They added Daryl Williams. They drafted Keonta Ingram. Like, there's other dudes here who could step in, even if it's not Eno. And so Connor's just unlikely to get that workload again. I think I lean towards possibility number two. Maybe not Eno replacing Edmonds one for one, but like, James Connor's not going to see that same workload again with Edmonds out of the lineup. Najee Harris was the only running back in the entire league to average at least 16.7 carries and 5.3 targets per game over the course of the entire season. James Conner has to get the largest workload in the league to maintain the production that he had without Chase Edmonds last year. And the final angle here is that last season, James Conner averaged 3.72 raw yards per carry. That was sixth lowest among all lead backs in the NFL. And even in the context of an inefficient running game in Arizona, James Conner averaged 0.92 yards per carry fewer than the other running backs in Arizona did collectively. That's the second lowest among lead backs in the NFL. And his box adjusted efficiency rating. So even if we want to say like, okay, yeah, he was less efficient than Chase Edmonds and the other guys, but he's running into heavier boxes. A, the boxes he was running into were barely heavier than what other guys were running into in Arizona. And B, even accounting for those box counts, the average carry for James Conner was worth 81.8% the output of the average carry for the collective other running backs with the Cardinals. That was the, that was the lowest box adjusted efficiency rating among all lead backs in the NFL last season. He's a 27-year-old running back coming off the least efficient season of his career. He's arguably the most touchdown and workload-dependent running back in the NFL, and he's likely to see regression in both of those areas. I do think his RB14 ADP is actually fairly efficient. It's not terrible, but I'm still passing at those prices given that he might just be cooked. He might just be washed at this point in his career. The next guy I want to talk about is Josh Jacobs, who finished as the RB13 last season and is currently being drafted as the RB22. In the three seasons that he's played in the NFL so far, he's finished between RB12 and RB15 every season and had the number 15, number 10, and number 9th highest opportunity shares in the entire league. And now, beat reports out of Las Vegas pretty much unanimously are indicating that this is going to be like a, a committee running back system under Josh McDaniels. The inside runners available for that committee are Jacobs, Zamir White, and Brandon Bolden. And the like receiving backs available for that committee are Jacobs, who could do that, Kenyon Drake, Amir Abdullah, Brandon Bolden can do that. He had 41 receptions in a part-time role with the Patriots last season, playing with McDaniels. I think Jacobs is going to be the number one guy in this committee, but history tells us, given what McDaniels has done in the past with his running backs, history tells us that even the number one role here might not be very much. From 2012 to 2021, during McDaniels' like second long tenure as the offensive coordinator in New England, the average opportunity share of his lead running back was 46.3%, which had an average rank of 35th in the league. The highest opportunity share that his lead running back ever had in New England from 2012 to 2021 was 56.9%, which ranked 24th in the league. This is not an offensive system that gives a lot of touches, weights its opportunity strongly towards its lead back. 
if Jacobs had those workloads, based on his 2021 stats, his finishes would have been as follows. With a 46.3% opportunity share based on Raiders' offensive efficiency and production from last year and based off Jacobs' own you know, rate stats, with a 46.3% opportunity share, he would have scored 11.72 points per game and would have been the RB28 in fantasy. If he had the highest opportunity share that McDaniels has ever given a running back, 56.9%, he would have averaged 13.32 points per game and finishes the RB22, which is exactly where he's being drafted right now. We can give him a slight bump in either of those situations for probable like offensive improvement, given the additions of like Devontae Adams and Josh McDaniels might be a more effective, you know, coordinator. But his ceiling is probably a mid-level RB2. And his floor, I believe, is nearly unusable as like a nothing RB3 who loses passing snaps to Abdullah, Drake, Bolden and loses goal line opportunities to Zamir White. I don't know that I'm predicting that, but I think that's within the range of outcomes. Zamir White in college had a 5.2% relative success rate, which measures, given the box counts that he's seeing, how often is he succeeding on his carries relative to the other backs at Georgia? He was succeeding on more than 5% more of his rushing attempts than the other Georgia running backs. That's in the 77th percentile. And last season, he was doing that at an 8.1% clip, which is in the 85th percentile. So he's really good at just like churning inside yards, succeeding on his carries at a high rate. And he was especially good in college in short yard situations near the goal line, you know, fourth and one, third and two type situations. Jacobs has been completely average on the ground so far in his career. His composite efficiency score, which measures like his, his percentile ranks in box adjusted efficiency rating and relative success rate, kind of like a mix of the two, just gives you kind of like bird's eye view efficiency relative to other backs in the league in 2019 he was 13th in that metric in 2020 he was 27th and in 2021 he was 18th those are his ranks among lead backs like he's he's not been especially good especially since his rookie season was the last time he was above average even if jacobs gets hurt for a couple games or just gets outplayed by zamir white as an inside runner jacobs is in the final year of his deal like there's no reason for them to go back to him as the number one runner in this committee I think he kind of feels like a safe pick in fantasy because he's always just like a steady low-end RB1, high-end RB2 that you can trust. But even if everything goes right this year as far as, you know, he doesn't lose a ton of work, he's the number one lead back, blah, blah, blah. I think he's just kind of a blah RB2 in a committee. If things go wrong, the floor is very low. I'm kind of out on Josh Jacobs even at cost this year. The last guy I want to talk about is Damian Harris who finishes the RB19 last year and is currently being drafted as the RB29. And the case against Damian Harris, even at that discounted price, is very simple. Last year, he scored 15 touchdowns on a 7.4% touchdown rate that, similar to James Connors, was more than double league average. And he had over 200 carries on the sixth highest scoring offense in the NFL, and it was still only the RB19. Touchdowns accounted for 42.8% of his total fantasy points, the most out of any running back in the top 70 in points per game. And again, this example of like, if we took away everybody's touchdowns, Damian Harris would drop from the RB19 to RB36. He scored fewer non-touchdown points per game than Clyde Edwards-Hilaire and Deontay Foreman last season. And now, Josh McDaniels is gone. Patriots have no official offensive coordinator right now. Supposedly, it's going to be some sort of tag team between Matt Patricia, who is their former defensive coordinator, and Joe Judge, who's their former special teams coordinator. Like, I don't who, I don't know if these guys know how to coach offense. I'm sure Bella, Bill Belichick has some sort of plan, but like, who knows if this is even a functional offense this season? And it's entirely possible that it's not nearly as functional as it was under McDaniels. Add on top of that, that Ramondre Stevenson is running with the ones in training camp, and he was better than Damian Harris on the ground last season. Damian Harris had a slight edge in yards per carry because he made, he created more big plays in the open field. But according to relative success rate, Damian Harris was succeeding on 0.5% fewer of his carries than other Patriots backs were. Ramondre Stevenson was succeeding on 5.6% more of his carries than other Patriots backs. So large disparity and consistency on the ground, very small edge to Damian Harris in overall efficiency. I think Ramondre Stevenson is just a better runner, and he's slimmed down this year. He's been working as a pri as the primary receiving back in training camp. He was already a better receiver than Harris last season and going back to college. I think the skill gap is not, not super wide here, but I think Ramondre Stevenson is a better player than Damian Harris, and I wouldn't be surprised if he becomes the RB1 in this offense this season. But the thing is that Damian Harris doesn't even need to lose his role or cede more touches in order to disappoint at cost. 
Going into last season, his career touchdown rate was 1.4%. Last season, it was 7.4%, so a massive jump up from where he'd been previously. But even a league average touchdown rate of 3.2% would have seen him lose 8.5 touchdowns over the course of the season and 3.4 points per game. That would have made him the RB35 and still overpriced at a current ADP of RB29. Thank <laughs> you.